I am Renee Wynn, and I'm currently NASA's Chief Information Officer. I am in charge of the global IT operations for NASA, and some of our IT is off the globe. What I wanted to do this, uh, this morning or today is to start with a video about NASA's upcoming flagship mission called Artemis. Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. It's very pretty out here. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface we are paving the way for human missions in 2024 our charge is to go quickly and to stay to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago we want lunar landers that are reusable that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. Great. Wow. Wasn't that inspiring? Artemis is the name of NASA's flagship mission that is headed back to the moon, and Artemis was Apollo's twin sister, so quite aptly named, as Artemis intends to put the first American female boots on the moon. We are building this next chapter together with our partners across the globe. The Artemis mission, as you see here, is plans on putting boots on the moon, as well as taking a look at ways for us to stay on the moon and go back and forth from Gateway, which is going to be hovering over the moon to allow us and our partners to go to different part of the moon in order to explore and understand the moon better, as well as the universe. 
Information technology is very much a part of NASA's journey to get back to the moon in a much more sustainable way. We currently have robots on International Space Station, and those are brought to us by our international partners, countries around the globe. We've got the Mission Operations Center, which is filled with IT operations. And then, of course, we are taking a look at different habitats, both on the moon as well as Mars, because we plan on getting the first human to Mars as well in a safe and secure manner. Society is very much dependent upon space services. As you can see here, there's a number of mi missions flying around the, the globe, actually around the universe for us to see, and satellites are very much part of human life uh, day to day on the Earth. There's about 1,800 active satellites in Earth's orbit alone. Uh, NASA has Voyager 2, which is over 12 million miles from Earth, which is still bringing back amazing data about our universe that we all share. There are eight countries and, uh, that have the capability to provide satellites, and there are certainly several countries where we can do our launches from. This is very different than my father's version of Apollo era and the space exploration. The capabilities are growing around the globe, and we're very excited to be working with a lot of folks to make a lunar orbit come true in a very different way when Artemis gets off the ground. And you can see there we've got a picture of International Space Station, which is a place where science takes place every single day, and that is to both learn more about the Earth as well as the ability to learn more about the universe and what would habitation need to be on another planet or there on the moon. Mobility is obviously a must when we go back to the moon in a more sustainable way. And you see here, we've got boots on the moon from our Apollo era. And here there is uh, several ways where mobility comes into play. The staying in contact with back at Earth with our mission control center, as well as if multiple astronauts are on the moon, the ability for them to communicate along the way. There's also gonna be more sensors built into the suit, so we'll be getting a lot more information about the astronaut inside the suit and potentially more information about what is going on outside of the suit with the atmosphere, whether it's on the moon or Mars. These sensors create a number of great opportunities to collect more information and to make new discoveries, and they present a little bit of a dark side, as I like to think of it, with cybersecurity. But I'll get to sensors a little bit in just a moment. As you'll see here in my next slide, as we talk about sharing information and that, we have relied on space being a harsh atmosphere to protect our satellites. That is still very much the case. However, communication between terra firma, Earth, and our assets in space has now got additional challenges with respect to threats through cybersecurity. This is, these are actual methods. There are actual capabilities to disrupt space communication. And so the challenges now are, can our assets in space survive the atmosphere and do what is intended with the scientific missions, as well as can we ensure that the integrity of the data coming back to Earth is in fact what it should be and that there are no disruptions in the communication causing harm to our satellites or other flying space assets. This, and I just talked about this a little bit, is the changing environment at space. And I also talked a little bit earlier about greater capacity. More and more countries, as well as schools, are entering into the space exploration journey, whether it's from CubeSats that they actually build and launch or using the data that we put out in the public on a regular basis. NASA provides regular data from space every single day for the use of greater humanity here around the globe, and we're very excited to be able to do that. There is a little bit of a change because in this current day and age, anything on the internet you should uh, question its integrity, and NASA needs to preserve both its reputation as well as the advancement of science by protecting our data that we share with everybody so that the integrity of the data is ensured and therefore the science that is discovered through it is also at its highest integrity level. 
But we don't just focus on the integrity of data. We need to look at the resiliency of these systems because once we get a satellite launched and it's collecting data or we put others on space station, there's a lot of opportunity to discover, make new discoveries in this in this environment. But so we, what we're trying to strive for is what we call uh, resiliency. And you'll see here in this photo how everything is very interconnected in space, which is, as you know, here on Earth, everything is very interconnected. And so what we try to do is build in the resi resiliency by saying something is going to happen. Can we build our systems in a way that they autonomously correct themselves or give us information on how we might uh, co make corrections should the asset have that type of connection back here at Earth? And this is really challenging us because it's a different way of doing business. And with satellites, building time takes a little bit of time. And so you've got to build that back at the beginning of the concept of the flying asset or satellite, as, well, as I call them, uh, flying assets or what I call them. And so we have to build that in. And we are seeing at NASA that our culture is changing. And as we anticipate future scientific missions and as we anticipate Artemis and all the stages of Artemis, we are building the resiliency in and we are acknowledging that the cyber threats are real, whether you're in space or here on terra firma. And I mentioned earlier about operational technology. As you see here on the, uh, on the test stand for our rocket, there are thousands of sensors available to us on there, and we want that rich data associated with firing a rocket engine. Um, and we need to be careful that none of those sensors get an inject of, mal of, of malintent that would hurt the rocket test or potentially affect the integrity of the data. Now, I've had the pleasure of going to a rocket test stand, and I gotta tell you, it was really cool. You could feel it within you as that rocket engine roared, and then, a few minutes after the end of the test, you needed to be careful that you wouldn't get wet because it forms a rain cloud uh, as it follows. And that actually did happen at our test. It was a beautiful day, and then we had our own private rain shower. Fortunately, I was in the car by the time that got to the location where I was standing. But these sensors, you can see we're using virtual reality for training purposes and also to being able to operate in a telepresence way between Earth and space. Now, of course, as NASA operates above the clouds, as do many other space agencies, we here on Earth are taking into full consideration and full capacity associated with cloud computing. As NASA goes forward, we will continue to have what I call a hybrid cloud strategy, which is, yes, we have our own data centers. We are now down to 19 data centers at NASA, and we are using the cloud. And it's that combination, that hybrid strategy that we use that allow us to make the best decision for the types of data and the partners that we are exchanging data with. On this chart, you will see that we've had an extreme increase in the cloud usage and just recently, I signed the authority to operate for using the Microsoft Azure Cloud. So NASA is growing its cloud vendor partners so that we have a variety of cloud capabilities because not each and every one of them is the same. And we can use those cloud capabilities and design our new missions with those in mind for accessibility to international partners as well as scientists all over the globe. And how do we benefit from our cloud computing? One way that we benefit is, is it allows us to have scalable or more elastic capability. So if there's a surge in data needs or in surge in data coming down from space, we can expand rapidly and then we can contract to the right spot. That is one thing that we really like. Another benefit of our cloud strategy is it allows us to put data closer to our customers of that data and protect NASA's infrastructure. And so this, is, this excites me as the NASA Chief Information Officer. As I've always say to folks, I am one breach away from losing my job, and I don't want to lose my job over breach. I would like to be the one that chooses when I am finished with my job in that. So what happens is, is we put the data off of our network. We allow folks to come in, use 
use our data, take the data as appropriate, or go ahead and put some tools on the data that allows you to do visualization and other analytical capabilities. And then that work is done in an environment that is not on NASA's network, which protects that our network from other uh, other bad actors associated with cybersecurity. The other opportunity is should something bad happen to that data, maybe by accident versus intentionally, we can reload the data back into that area so that we know that our clients or our customers are using the highest integrity of data when they are exploring space, uh, space science. And our Earth Science Data Systems has a single largest repository for data, which I've been talking about. This is the paradigm that I have in my mind when I'm talking about access to information, is the Earth, the rich data that NASA provides to a, a number of scientists around the globe, as well as students around the globe, to explore the Earth. And they are growing in capacity, as you can see here. And we have missions now that are being built with the cloud as the back compute capability. Why is that important? When you go to a cloud infrastructure, you do have to design for it. This is one of the reasons why NASA is always going to have a hybrid approach. Some of our older missions that are continuing to fly that are bringing back rich data about the universe, we're not going to redesign them in order to put them in the cloud. We're going to continue to operate those servers ourselves in, in order to save the money and use that for other purposes. Because cloud architecture is very, very different, or at least we're finding at NASA, is very different than the architecture that we have in our data centers. And of course, I would be remiss to not invite you to follow NASA so that you too can watch us on our journey to put the first American females back on first American female boots on the moon as we go back to the moon. But each and every day we share data about the universe and about our own Mother Earth to help all of us make better neighbors in our universe when it comes to living safely as well as a living may be even uh, environmentally friendly. So with that, I will sign off and say it has been a pleasure and a bit of a challenge to deliver my speech in a way that is uh, shares about NASA's mobility, as well as our little bit about our security, as well as our use of cloud computing, both below those cloud line and of course above those clouds. So keep reaching for the stars and take care.